I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 4 uh, in our study of the book of Mark. And at the end of the last uh, episode, we read the parable of the sower, uh, which we talked about back in our Matthew study as well from Matthew 13. It's a really interesting, it was kind of a pivot for Jesus because up to this point, he's been you know, casting out demons. He's been healing people and he has been teaching and, and preaching, it says, but we haven't really known what he was talking about until from Mark's perspective, until we get here to chapter four. And then we were talking about how on the last podcast, Chase, we were talking about how that he uses these parables uh, as his way uh, of teaching. And and it's interesting as to the why of that. We kind of got in that a little bit on our overtime. So you, you were making a, you never quite got to your point. No, we ran out of time. It's hard to get a word in edgewise at this stage. But <laughs> I just find it fascinating that one, you know, here's a Jesus should have been the greatest political figure ever because he just completely changed the culture in the, uh, locally in that he is healing diseases. He is casting out demons. He is trying to change the hearts of people doing sinful things from the tax collectors and the mismanagement of money and all the corruption that goes with all that. And then the next chapter, he's going to raise the dead. He calmed the storm. I mean, you just think about all the things in life that causes problems. He had the power and, and showed it to do all this. And people are not accepting him as the son of God. They're trying to plot and kill him, the religious leaders and political parties. And he's a threat. He's viewed as a threat, not not this fix of the world, even though he's fixing the world, which I find fascinating. So he he gives the insight to the his disciples about using parables where that it reveals the overall message of his ministry, which was this introduction to this kingdom. He gave a little insight about it when he said that the real family of God are those who do the will of God, you know, in the previous paragraph, which shows you that this this kingdom is eternal and it's a family structure. I mean, we're going to live forever with God. So when people hear the message about Jesus, which he says the word in the parable of the sower, they respond differently. But we all know that only a few are going to accept it. And he kind of gives them the reasoning when he explains the the parable and why that is so. So the point I was getting at is here's the creator of the universe who's now in a human form. And he's a man. But you got to remember, Jesus actually created all these seeds that we in, in the material universe he was in on that. Nothing that has been created was created without Jesus, you know, in John 1. And so, and it's a phenomenon. Now, science, y'all remember when you were in school, science tells you kind of how the process works, and people say, I believe in science. But still, they can't explain who's making this stuff grow. Who is making things with seeds grow? And live. And so you probably see where I'm headed with that. You know, when Paul gave his analogy in First Corinthians, what is that, chapter two or chapter three, when he said, you know, uh, Paul planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. God's making this grow. That's why in the parable of the sower, the only caveat that that really makes sense is that and and I call it the parable of others. Some people are like seed sown along the path where the world where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown into them. After that, Jace, it's others, verse sixteen, others, verse eighteen. And others, verse 20, others, others, others. 
It gives you the various reasons. Some don't get it at all, and the blame is put on the evil one. Well, but the rest I think of them the people, are the ones who are very the people stable. allow the evil one to do that. I mean, you're eventually going to get to a verse where it's like, resist the evil one, he'll flee from you. Yep. And in that same book, when James' book, remember when he said, uh, humbly accept the word planted in you, yep. which can save you? And I'm going back to my point that God makes this grow. When you introduce Jesus to people, this is the way God designed to reach humanity. He sent Jesus in human form. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He was resurrected. He's now representing us in heaven. He shows us this This is possible. This can happen. You can live You ask the question, who makes it grow? Who See? makes who well, who makes the corn pop out of the ground go into a stalk and produce another ear of corn because this this corn and who, is dead who keeps it from growing is the parable of the sower exactly who, yeah that's a great who, point who, who, who grows it and who keeps it from growing and uh, and, the, and, and, the the, and that becomes the in, distinction yeah. yeah, that you're right. That that becomes the distinction, and and you got it, Jace. It's who you know. When he said in verse eleven, he said to them, he told them the disciples, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. The secret is not a what. The secret there is a who. Yeah. Because what made them different? Jesus. I mean that he is the secret to the kingdom of God. And the, the other thing, when he mentions Dad, you said the others. Every time he mentions Word, what's the Word? Well, we know from John one one who the Word is, not what the Word is. Yep. So this thing comes back to a who throughout all of these parables. And Jace, you read earlier the next one when it's and he basically says who does it because all you do is put the seed in the ground and go get in the bed, and then everything starts happening. Well, and you're doing that because you now have the same spirit that Jesus had, and you function in the same capacity. But and God— Whoever makes it grow is where the power is. That's where the power is. But look, just, just think about it, the analogy. He didn't give you just some—because you, you think, well, he made this story up. No, you can go out there outside and look at who's who's making all this stuff grow from a, from a pin oak tree. And so that's why we have this big debate. But it trickles down, and, and finally, as a follower of Jesus, you start looking at what's being taught in these public schools and in science class, and you're saying, these people are, they're, they're stupid. This is not, this is not possible. They're, they're not, it's not stupidity. It's, it's um, willful ignorance. It's, it's going back to the, what we talked about last time, with the blaspheme of the Holy I'll agree, Spirit. I'll agree with so, that. So, so, yeah, so so listen to this. In, in reference to the mystery that we just read about um, in, in Mark um, chapter 3, was it 11, 411? What was the verse again that you just uh, quoted now? Yeah, that was 4, four uh, 411. Yeah, so listen, listen to what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians and then in Ephesians. He says that, uh, I, I referenced this in the last podcast when we were talking about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but... He says, um, you know, the rulers of this age are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. It's the same exact language that Jesus is using in Mark 4. It's the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We had a question that popped up from one of our listeners um, the other day of whenever I'd said something about that Satan did not know the plans of God and of what he was trying to accomplish to the crucifixion, because if he would have, he wouldn't have killed the Lord of glory. And she's, where did you get that, that from? I got it from this verse right here. So when you talk about the who, it's not just the who, it's also what he did and the accomplishment that he did, which it's, it's the scandal of the cross. It's that Philippians 2 passage, which if you try to explain the gospel to an unspiritual mind, they're going to look at you and they're going to think, I, this does not make any sense. But when the Holy Spirit illuminates your heart, that's when you get it. Because he says here in Ephesians 3, uh, by referring to this, when you read, uh, you can understand my insight into what? 
the mystery of Christ. What's the mystery? Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Well, that's quite the run on sentence. But the point is, is like what the mystery is, is that God is grafting Gentiles into this covenantal promise that is fulfilled in the most bizarre way where all other religions are man climbing the mountain to get to the top, to get to God, to prove that they're good enough. And here's this bizarre message that's so bizarre that it's divine of God comes down to rescue his people. And then he's opening his arms up, John 1, 1, to save the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John three sixteen. 16. That, that, that's the mystery. And if you go to somebody who who is not a spiritual mind, unless the Holy Spirit illuminates their heart to this understanding, it's going to sound like nonsense, which takes us right back to the last podcast on the block. Why is it so scary to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Because he's the one that's going to tell you about the mystery of the gospel of Christ. Don't reject that. Good point. No, I like it. Uh, I, I want to read the what it, what it means. And we read last podcast the, the parable of the sower. So then when he got to 10, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he said, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So that, and he quotes Isaiah 6, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, the evil one comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word at once, receive it with joy, but they have no root and they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke it, choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. All right, so uh, let's take a break. So this podcast is sponsored by Faithful Counseling, and uh, it's 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 one of our favorite sponsors because I think all of us have been uh, at, at some point in our lives provided a biblical counseling, you know, for people because you know we've been doing this a long time and deal with a lot of young people with a lot of problems, and uh, and we have received uh, counsel as well, and you do in the ebb and flow of life, uh, and you need that because there's just times when you. You know, things are going wrong and you just need a, a guide is what is what I call a counselor. They can help guide you into that. And so these guys provide this online, which is great because you may not, you know, know where a counselor is in your area. And so it gives you a chance to have a weekly video or a phone session. Uh, you don't have to be on camera uh, if you don't want to be. Uh, they match you with a great counselor, somebody that can help you. Uh, so here's what you do uh, if you need a little bit of help. And we've all needed it at some point. You go to faithfulcounseling.com slash unashamed. You get professional faith-based counseling that you deserve. Uh, They've got a special offer for unashamed listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first month at faithfulcounseling.com slash unashamed. Thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. So let me first deal with this. Let's talk about this quote that he does from Isaiah because it's stuck right in the middle of it, and it seems kind of bizarre. Yeah, because why wouldn't God want everybody? I thought God wanted everybody to be saved. So what's the problem? Exactly. So here's what you have to do, I think, to fully understand why Jesus used that passage. 
if you go back to Isaiah, and I encourage you to do this. Obviously, we don't have time on the podcast to read the whole thing. But if you'll read for Isaiah 4 through 7, it'll set the context of where this quote came from. Because in, in, in Isaiah chapter 4, there's a passage there that talks about the branch of the Lord. And he's talking about Jesus. So we know this is like a messianic uh, prophecy that Isaiah is doing. And then he gets to chapter six. So he brings up that idea of the eternal branch in chapter four. And then in chapter six, he says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe filled the temple. Then he goes on to describe it. And it's very much like what he described, what John described in Revelation. And starting in chapter four of Revelation, this idea of looking into heaven and seeing God and seeing all these, you know, what's happening. And so, so Isaiah's having a moment here in his day in Isaiah six. And he says, uh, he looks at in verse five, says, woe to me. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. He's talking about himself. I live among a people of unclean lips. So this is a real low time for Israel. And my eyes have seen the King, the almighty God, one of the seraphs, which was an angel, flew to me with a live coal in his hand that he had taken from the tongs. And he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So we're having, we're having this revelation of this branch he mentioned in chapter four is coming. And then when you get to chapter seven and verse 14, and Isaiah gives you, he tells you exactly who it's going to be because he says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. So the whole context of this is that things are bad, but something good is coming. Now let me read the quote from Isaiah, the quote that Jesus quoted. In chapter 6, the angel tells Isaiah, says this, Go and tell the people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull, close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So that's where the quote comes from. What does he mean by that? Well, Isaiah goes on to say, then I said, for how long, Lord? In other words, how long would people not want to believe? And then he says, until the cities lie ruined. And he describes all this. And then at the end, he said, and all the trees are cut down, leave the stumps. So the holy seed will be the stump in the land. So in other words, he says, all this destruction, all this parts turned away from God, there's one who's coming. So you just need to continue to tell people this is you're a ruined people. You're not doing the right thing and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And then we would know in 750 years later, Jesus would come. And so that, that really is the setting for what Jesus then describes about why he's teaching in parables is because now he's here. Well, let me jump in there because I think I would say you need to go ahead and add reading Isaiah chapter nine along with that, because you got to remember all okay. these people that he's talking to and are hearing this the religious leaders, they were very familiar with what Isaiah the prophet said, and they were looking for this coming one. And I think the Correct. problem is they had formed an erroneous opinion of what that was going to look like. Because when you read Isaiah 9, he starts off talking about uh, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. And he gets to verse 2. He says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. And he talks about war in verse five every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning will be fuel for the fire and so you say what is he talking about well then he reveals it in isaiah 9 6 and i guarantee you all those religious leaders could quote this oh yeah for us a child is born to us a son is giving given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, who's he? Ta who's Isaiah talking about? Oh, we know who he's talking about, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Well, now we're getting into what we're talking about in Mark. It seems like Jesus has come. 
establishing and upholding it, the kingdom, with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so you say, well, what's your point? Why are you reading this? Because when they saw Jesus, they had interpreted this. You start talking about, uh, you know, he's going to be the end of the wars. And the, they were focusing on the end of the wars and the government on his shoulders. And they did not like how this was transpiring. They're like, well, you're not him because where's the political edge here? That, that's good, man. That's so good. Because how, how relevant is that for today? When me and Phil talked about this yesterday on the phone, like you know, we're, we're obsessed. And look, I ran for Congress. I ran for office. I have a background in politics, but I will tell you the conclusion that I've come to after seeing how the sausage is made and looking behind the curtain is that our problem is not a political fix. It is not. It's just not. And I think that the, the, the Jews at this time, the Pharisees, Man, such a good point and that, you, that you read that out of Isaiah. If you read that out of Isaiah, you would probably interpret it the same way if you didn't have the context of, who, of what Jesus did, right? You would think, this guy's coming. When the Messiah gets here, he, the, the government is going to sit on his shoulders. He is going to set up an earthly kingdom, and he, we are about to dominate and get everything that we always thought. And then he came, and he died. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold and on, he was a, a friend of people that are he's not welcome. So that's why I think born, uh, I, that's why I think that that needed to be hidden because they were t- trying to take Jesus's coming in a manner that was not godly. That was not part of the plan. We're not going to go overthrow Rome and build bigger houses and and invite yeah. all the you know all our friends over and sit around and drink wine and say look how awesome Jesus is and then try to conquer the man world man made man made constructs is not the way to go they here. missed it they missed it and he didn't they missed it because and, and think about this though they they missed it because here's what they wanted they said this is what they were essentially saying we will submit to God as long as we get to to keep our power structure right we're we're in it for the power. We see the power of God, and we want in on that. But those are the kind of people's heart that God does harden. He does harden people's heart. I mean, it's not a popular topic, but God does do those things. He does hide Himself because there will be a time. Philippians two says this. There's going to be a time in history, in the future, when the Lord of Glory reveals Himself. There, we're going to see Him, and the, and the Bible says that every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Everybody's going to say at some point, everybody falls on their face before the living God. Why? They're going to fall on their face because they're going to see his power. And God's like, I'm not looking for people to follow me out of my power. I'm looking for people to follow me because I love them and they want to be with me. So even when you get to like um, Pharaoh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? But listen to why he hardened Pharaoh's heart. This is in uh, uh, chapter seven of Exodus six. He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. What does that mean? He, he, what he's saying is that like, I'm about to unleash some miracles that anybody in their right mind would fold under the power that I'm about to unleash on these people. So what I'm going to do is, because I want to I want to do 10 of them. I got 10 plagues, and I'm out, but I want to get through all 10 plagues. So I'm going to, the, the, the Hebrew word is, is chazak. I'm going to, I'm going to strengthen Pharaoh in his resolve so that I can accomplish these miracles and these things so that people will be talking about this story for years and years to come because it foreshadows the gospel. So God does harden. God does hide himself. There is a mystery that God's like, I, I'm not going to show you because you're you're not seeking truth. You're in it for the power. You're not in it for the right reasons. And like you got to come to Jesus. When God illuminates your heart, it's an illumination of of, of humility. It's a, and it's an illumination of, of, of sacrifice. It's dying to self. It's completely paradoxical to what we think a God would come like. Let's take another break. So, uh, you know, the overturning of Roe v. Wade this year is is really, it's it's been really interesting because I've been doing a lot of travel. Lisa and I have been speaking a lot in uh, pro-life events, and there's just a real enthusiasm uh, on the pro-life side. We feel like for the first time, really in 50 years, that that we're beginning to win this battle uh, to protect the lives of the unborn as well as to help young women and young men uh, make better decisions. And so we need great groups that we can walk alongside. And one of those is a sponsor of our podcast. Their name is 40 Days for Life. We've had Sean, their CEO, on our, our podcast before. 
great group, great, great people. They have over a million volunteers in a thousand cities. And what they do is they just pray. They go, they're, they're not harassing anybody. They just pray outside these facilities and pray for God to do great things. And, and that's exactly what he's doing. A lot of have, have shut down uh, because of this prayer and these groups like this. Um, a lot of people don't show up uh, that they find out, you know, from a former Planned Parenthood directors. They say, you know, for some reason they just quit showing up. And we know why, uh, because they're making better decisions. So we want you to check them out. It's a great uh, organization to be a part of, to volunteer your time for. Check out their locations, maybe see if they're near you. Check out their podcast. And also they have a free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. And it's going to keep you updated on what's going on. So that's four zero forty days for life dot com and uh, check them out. I want to reiterate this point I made. Ironically, the backdrop of him discussing things in parables and the hardening of some hearts and the softening of others comes when if you just look at what he's doing from a political standpoint. They should embrace this. He's healing diseases. He's casting out demons. He's helping. We're going to get to in the next chapter. He's helping the homeless. He's helping the mentally impaired. Look, he has the ability to calm the storm. It's all around us in modern day. He's literally making life awesome here yeah. for all people, from the poorest of the poor to those downtrodden. And, and the response is from the political parties and the groups of people and the, even the religious hierarchy is kill him, which in essence is going to be the and way. bad mouth his it, messengers too. But in essence, that is the ultimate way that God is going to redeem everyone by him dying. Which I just think, look, if you were trying to come up with a story like this, you would never be able to pull it off. You know, and not one that's based look, on here's, historical facts. Here's, here's fact. another, here's another mind bender. So you re we read from Isaiah four, Isaiah six, Isaiah nine. If you keep going, you get to Isaiah fifty three and fifty four. Guess what? Guess what? They were all told was going to happen. This Messiah, this branch, this holy one, this righteous one was going to be killed in a terrible, terrible way. And he's going to be like a, a root out of dry ground. Not supposed to be there. Yes. Won't work. They missed it. That's the part they didn't miss. That, that's the part they didn't get. They, 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 they didn't see that part. And they didn't, when it came, they were like, whoa, we didn't see that coming. But you think about like it does matter. That I mean, obviously, God illuminates the heart. The Spirit illuminates the heart. The Spirit opens us up. The Spirit reveals this Christ to us. But our soil does matter, according to this parable. I mean, we That's right. and, and, uh, it does matter to have good soil versus rocky soil and all the different variations of the of the four soils and the and that one good soil. The reason why you know it's good, but is because it was receptive to the planting. And 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 the, and the fruit it, it it had fruit that came out of it. It wasn't a temporary, uh, you know, like emotional moment. It was like that heart, that soil was was prepared to receive revelation from God. He said in verse twenty, others, the last one, like seed sown on good soil, gotta have it, or your seeds not gonna grow. Well, but I think this is where some people go too far and say, well, there's nothing I can do. And there's only a select group that have the good soul, and it was predetermined. And so, you know, I, I mean, I'm saying the argument I'm playing, I'm not going to say devil's advocate, but from an argumentative view, but I just think it should be a warning to all of us to be open-minded and to search and stay away from traditions of men and, you know, stay away from, uh, you know, groups of people who are not focused on Jesus and his grace Plus that, leave that is it up, offered. Leave it up to God instead of saying in your mind, I don't think that old dude's going to make it. Well, oh, hey, that, that hey, to me, you're hey, right, Phil. When hey, you, because that's I what I don't know the whole, whether he'll ever make it or that's not. That's what the whole pharisaical problem, the reason they couldn't understand the parables is because they're passing judgment on every 
person either based on where they're from, yeah. what they did, their nationality, and they that's in too much. I mean, it's just too much as you do. You... Well, I, I, it is, I think I think it's it's worthy of note that that faith faith does not negate um, pursuit. Right. It doesn't negate the pursuit of, of God. And I think yeah, you're right, Jason. A lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, uh, I don't have to do anything because I'm God's elect or whatever. And that would probably be not a true representation of, of Reformed theology. But but that is a big discussion. Right. And how like what? So what the soil is God doing? it? Am I doing it? And, you know, is it modernistic, synergistic and all these these terms we come up with in debates. But I think the you, you read the book of Romans. And there's this letter, like I said earlier, I think I said it in a previous podcast, there's a big bracket around the first and the last um, paragraph in the book of Romans that, that Paul says why, why he wrote the book and what he was called to do was to bring from the Gentiles, to bring them to the obedience of faith. So he, he has this whole argument. The whole book of Romans is this argument that kind of coalesces into Romans chapter 9. And he says in Romans chapter 9, um, let me not quote it let me read it he says that that the the gentiles romans chapter 9 verse 30 says what shall we say then that the gentiles who did not pursue there's the pursuit word righteousness that they attained it even the righteousness which is by faith but israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law why why did why did why did israel not get it and then and why were the gentiles grafted in right here because they did not, the Jewish people, Israel, did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. So you say, what does that mean? It, the, the good soil, it is the pursuit of God. It's just that we have to pursue God by faith, meaning that we are, we are responding to the revelation of the Holy Spirit. When he, when he convicts us on anything or shares anything or reveals anything to us, we say, God, you are telling the truth. And then are responding in that. That's good soil. And to the degree that I do that, guess what? Think a fruit starts to increase in my life. I'm not battling the same old stuff. When I was uh, young, it was with your your son Phil, Jeff, and and your brother, uh, your brother guys. I, like, what were you doing? We were out there getting drunk, and we were smoking weed, and with all those things. Like, I don't struggle with smoking weed. I'm not even tempted to do that. But at 18 years old, yeah, I was. He said, "What's changed? I've been walking with the Spirit for 20 something years." God's delivered me because there's a fruit in my life now. That's good soil. It's not us. It's not anything that we're doing. It's not anything we pat ourselves on the back. It's just that well, I'm just I want to receive what God is is delivering. I just want to receive it. That's well, it. That's good soil. And I, I want to read this. Uh, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God who's making it grow, by the way, gives it a body as he de determined. And to each kind of body, each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Now, y'all know that's talking about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, but I'm going to make a point here that God, through Jesus, in this parable, used something that could be a reminder anywhere on the planet that somebody is making that corn and those trees pop up out of the ground and bringing life to them, and they're reproducing with the seed. Something is doing that. I've had debates. I've had discussions. I had a guy one time say, well, that's if you want to know who that is, that's Mother Nature. And I said, well, go get her because I want to have a conversation with her about how this is happening. Well, that ended this discussion because now you're having to have faith in Mother Nature just like I'm having faith in the divine father yep. who created thing. The difference is I have some documentation and some history and some, you know, <laughs> some other facts that is way more appealing than if it was just mother, mother nature. <laughs> but what I was going to say to your point, Zach, is when you think about the spiritual repercussions of this, that seed, let's just take corn. It, it's not, it's not that much to look at when it dies, but it goes in the ground and all of a sudden it comes, it comes out better. It, it's, it, it's better. And, and when you fast forward to this and you realize what Jesus did through his death and his burial and resurrection, and when you look at what we uh, represent when we die and we're buried and we're resurrected, it gets back to that planting a seed 
burying it, you know, in the ground, which is a cold, dead place. And the first thing you notice is it doesn't take, Jace, but one seed. And when you look at it, it comes up on a stalk. It, and on both sides of it, there's about 100, 100, 150, I don't know how many grains of, of corn there is growing on one ear, but that thing reproduced, I mean, a lot. I mean, you, you get two ears sticking out or three, and it's loaded and it looks just like the one you planted. You say, that thing is, is... That's why I made the comment that when I was in science class in high school... Hang on, Joe. Let's take a break. That's why when I made the comment and when I was in high school and I was taking biology and I was learning how this stuff was happening from their perspective, which was a non-God view, I said, this is just stupid. I mean, I remember having a debate with a guy and he's like telling me, you know, we came from monkeys. And I'm like, they're still here. And he was like, what? I was like, why are the monkeys still here? He's like, yeah, but at one time, a certain group of them branched off and turned into humans. I'm like, you actually want me to believe this? <laughs> I mean, they're at a campfire and they're like, look, half of us are going the human route. Yeah. The, but you know, you see how silly we are in all that uh, just in life because, you know, back when we were discovering space and sending rockets and you remember what they did? They didn't want to put a human in that first rocket, so they went and grabbed a monkey. And what I always found fascinating was they put a helmet on the monkey. And I thought, why are we protecting his brain? He's not going to be able to tell us anything he's learned. <laughs> it's, but in our minds, we thought, well, maybe if that's where we came from, we want to protect that experience and information. and. I just think when you when you look at a parable like this that makes real life make sense because there has to be an answer in your mind down deep in your heart that there is someone the evidence is too overwhelming somebody's making the physical things grow and when you look at Jesus being here and you start looking in your life and saying how am I going to view you know, my life and what's in my heart. And w the more you walk with Jesus, the more it all starts making sense. And I think that's what makes you have a good heart because you start realizing, you know what? I, I've got a, I, I've got a maker. What I've got a creator. Say, Jay, says, whatever's making the corn grow makes us grow. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Luke Bryant song. You know, I, it, it's funny though, that when you mention to your larger point that this idea that, which I think, by the way, is probably the grand mystery. I mean, Ephesians defined it as the Gentile inclusion into the into into Judaism, so to speak. Um, but that's really not even the ultimate mystery. That that that's a that's a symptom. That's a that's a byproduct of the big mystery. The big mystery is what you just said that that the the old way is dying, and and the new way is coming. The 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 temple system is dying and a new temple is emerging. The, the, you know, everything is about, there's a death coming and then there's a resurrection coming. The first Corinthians passage you mentioned is, yeah, it's a lot about our, our physical resurrection, but, but you go and uh, uh, Paul says in, what was it? First Thessalonians about obedience to the gospel. We're obeying the death, the burial and the resurrection of Christ. There is like we, Mark 16 or Matthew 16, we have to die to ourself. And, um, and that's a good thing because when we die, just like the seed that was dead and was planted by the sower in, in good soil, like that seed sprouted up into something way more than any of us could ever comprehend. It's it, That is the law of the new way. That is kind of like, what is the law of Christ? It's a uh, death to life, but not, not just to life, to abundant life. That's what the Holy Spirit is ultimately revealing. And that's what the motivation is for us is that, you know, Jesus said for the joy set before, or Bible says for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. But why did Jesus die? Well, for the joy 
that was set before him, the joy of what was going to happen in the resurrection, the joy of what was going to happen in the ascension, the joy of what was going to happen as he sits at the right hand of God and mediates for his people, the joy that he's going to come back one day and redeem all of us and pull us up to live with him forever. Like that's the joy that was set before him. And in the same way, we are to embody that sacrificial death. We're, we're to embody that death and that life, not because it's the sacrifice and we're earning brownie points with God by giving something up, quite the opposite. We sacrifice not to give up anything. We sacrifice to gain everything. That makes sense? Yeah. And you know, the, well, you remember when he said, he who has ears, let him hear. That's really the secret to the heart because Zach, you were over in Romans nine through you know 11 earlier when talking about the, the mystery of the Gentiles. But Paul says something very interesting to go along with what Jesus said. He who has ears, let him hear. Paul said in verse 17 of chapter 10 of Romans, consequently, faith comes from hearing. It's not that you already have faith. First, you have to hear. Faith comes from hearing what? The message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ, who Christ is. Which was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I, uh, this is a great question. If if faith comes from hearing the word, if I'm going to hear something, then what does somebody else have to do? They have to speak. They have to Correct. speak. And so, Which is what he said earlier in, in chapter 10. Yeah, that's it. The Spirit, the Spirit's revealing these things to us. That's why when you, you say, what, what, blaspheme the Spirit. Yeah, you, you, if faith comes from hearing the word, and the only way I can hear is if God speaks, and God speaks to me through the Holy Spirit, and I reject the Holy Spirit, and every time he speaks, it says, you're lying, Holy Spirit. Then he's like, we well, can't be forgiven for that. Why not? Because he's telling you the way to be forgiven, and you're saying, I reject that. Like it, it's, it's not rocket science. Don't reject. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's kind of what going on here well and who's the yeah, word you're not believing the the, the pathway there was a right? figure in the so, bible hang, known hang as on the Jace, word. let's take our, let's take our last let's take our last break who is known as the word jesus, jesus. Oh. john 1 1 yeah, so i said all this to say i want to read this because because i did want to make that transition into the spiritual just like jesus did with nicodemus you know, he said, you need to be born again and be born in water and spirit. And Nicodemus said, well, how can I, what do you mean? How can I get back into my mother's womb? You know, and then he starts explaining the mystery of how the spirit works in human beings. Well, when you read first Peter one 22, everything we've set up until this point, I think it explains the reason he's telling the parable of the sower. He says, now that you have purified yourselves, by obeying the truth. So we hear Jesus and we respond. Uh, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, which would be a, a fruit of the Spirit. Love one another deeply from the heart. Now watch this very carefully, verse 22. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed. You say, seed? What, what's he bringing that, bringing that up for? Because it's the same concept of when you die, when you respond to Jesus, because of the word you heard that's been planted in you, you're then buried just like you would plant a perishable seed of corn or whatever. But you it's not a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Because God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. And look what he makes the example. He makes this quote in 1 Peter, which is uh, from Isaiah 40, Al. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. That's like, pretty well the whole like, story. It's fascinating to me that you can that you can look at a corn pistago corn growing and go through that in your heart on how did this get here? How is that made? How is the how are these things reproducing? You you're introduced to Jesus and you're like, oh, I can spiritually transform 
through the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit just like that. And the difference is I'm going to live forever in that position. Yeah, and and at the very beginning of what you just read, notice the correlation of that five-letter word, truth. It's in the center of all of this, and so you have truth is in the center of all the soil, everything. that if, If you're going to experience a transformation, I promise you this, truth is going to be at the center of it. The classical definition of truth is when my thought matches up with reality, the way the world really is. That That is what truth means, that my thought, my thought, whatever I'm thinking, it matches what is real in the world. And the goal of the Holy Spirit, the main goal, is to make sure that we know what is true. That's why at the end of that uh, that passage in John 17, I, I said earlier that the most exhausted text in the Holy Spirit, because you're not going to have, if you're going to have truth at the center of it, you're not going to get truth outside of the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. And this is what Jesus said um, at the end of John 17, uh, or, or almost at the end, John 17, 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctification, being freed from the power and the grip of sin. How do I How do I really experience transformation in my life? Because there are a lot of people listening right now that are like, man, I am not. I love Jesus. I'm trying to follow him, but man, I do not see transformation. Transformation comes from submitting to the Spirit as he reveals truth to you. That's why I said earlier, when you're tempted with sin, the Spirit doesn't say it's wrong or right. He says it's true or false. He's saying this is reality. This is real because this is where I'm at. And the ultimate prize is to live in the presence of God and to dwell with him. And that's what Jesus is offering here. So the big mystery is that it's truth that God came down and is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, that's why Pilate, who was a government official, remember what he asked Jesus when Jesus went through this? You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not from here. My kingdom's of another place. And you remember what Pilate asked? He said, what is truth? He was so close, yet so far, because if he would have asked, who is the truth? Because Jesus in John 14, you know, you you mentioned that John 14 through 17, but he laid the foundation because a lot of people say, well, how do I, how how am I ever going to be fine? You know, how are we going to find out what truth is? Because everyone argues about the truth. This is the truth as I see it. This is the truth as you see it. So let's argue about the data or the history and try to find out what's true. And Jesus cleared it all up by the foundation principle when he said, I am the truth. But Jace, Jace, the reason the reason he couldn't ask the right question was because he couldn't see. Jesus as being the king of anything. Remember, he said, I have the power to decide whether you live or die. And Jesus is like, nope, you don't. But he couldn't see that. In other words, in that situation you described with Pontius Pilate, he thought he had all the power and he was talking to the creator of the universe. That's why, that's why you, he couldn't ask who. That's why if you had to rank the sins, if you were going to rank them, the number one, the the one you mu- you must stay away from at all cost. I think it's the worst is pride because it keeps you from seeing the truth, which is a person you have. You have a a premeditated uh, way of thinking that you cannot you, you just can't go along with Jesus coming down here. The son of God, the savior of the world and go into a guy's house who's a tax collector. So you you just throw out everything based on that. Well, that's pride. That, that's pride. Yeah, that, 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 and, and I think that that's, uh, it's, I'm so glad you guys brought up the, the Jesus is the personification of truth. Cause that, in that, in that text that I read, your word is truth. You think about how Jesus or how John started his gospel in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And so I think that that when when we say that uh, truth is the matching of our thought with reality, well, what is real? Ultimately, what is real is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because there was a there, like that's that's the only I want to say thing. It's the only person. It's the only body. It's the only essence. It's the only being. It's the only being yeah. that has eternally existed. Is God Himself? So, in all of God's revelation from the Holy Spirit, 
like I said, what's he, what's he really, what's, what's he really ultimately revealing? It, it, it's even beyond truth and false. Ultimately, what God is revealing is himself. Exactly. Why would he do that? And you know because why? he wants to have it. Why? Well, because people like me who, you know, I'm based on the worldly view. I'm not very smart. I'm just, I'm just not, you know, I mean, I barely made it through high school, but I can, I can see a person and I can watch him and I say, okay, I, I, I get it. And that's why I think Jesus, he chose these ordinary men. And what did they do? What was his main commission? I told y'all, uh, you weren't here on that podcast, but I told you, I thought the most profound statement in the first three chapters of Mark that we had read was that when he said in verse 14 of chapter 3, he appointed 12, designated them apostles, that they might be with him. It wasn't like he was going to give them, I mean, he did, you know, he taught them. And what, they, the presence of being in God, being with God through Jesus, walking with him on a daily basis is what made them the most powerful people, the smartest people, the most wise, because at the end of the day, you saw their ministry on what that led to through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, were they the smartest people on the planet at that time? Yes. Yeah. Because ultimately it comes, it comes with this fact. If you can figure out your purpose on earth, if you can figure out how you even got on the earth, but you can figure out how you can live forever with the creator of the universe. That is the ultimate education. That's the ultimate teaching. That's the, you're the smartest person out of all people because you figured out a way, and it was God's idea, not yours, to live forever. Well, if you pull and that's that why off, he you said, got, well, <coughs> the, what else do you need? That's why he said the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, talking about the 12. Let me read this text before we sign off, and we can talk about it a little bit in overtime. It's the next thing that he says to the disciples. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? This is after he explains to them the parable of the sower. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, there's a statement again, but now he's talking to the disciples, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him. So we'll uh, we'll unpack that a little bit in the overtime as we kind of wrap up uh, this thought. So if you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed uh, to hear a little more pontification. And I don't care what they say, boys. That's an exciting read. <laughs> well, you're going to be is. surprised to hear what I think about that next, the Ooh, next paragraph. There's a, there's a tease for overtime. Yeah, we'll see you on, on the other side. It's spoken from a man that's not very smart. I'm C plus. Well, I'm D minus. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.